I would like to start by thanking the organizers and all of you for your interest coming here. Um, so it's a wonderful crowd. So I look forward to telling you a little bit about the visual cortex and um, some aspects of what visual perception does for you. And also I will talk a little bit about cognitive tasks that involve the visual cortex. So this is a picture where there is a lot of information. And what we and many others would like to understand is how we really perceive this, right? So you seem to understand what is in this picture at a glance. And that is actually maybe not entirely how, how it is in your brain. And that's what I would like to, uh, to talk about. So you basically see the animals and you basically see how it all fits together. And that that happens is actually quite amazing because visual perception starts with fragmentation. So neurons in early levels of the visual system have tiny receptive fields that at first sight only seem to be concerned with a very small region of visual space, right? So all these computations are at first sight taking place locally. And this is very, very different from how we perceive. We seem to kind of oversee the entire picture and you don't have a hard time seeing that this and this is part of the same perceptual object. So somehow all these local processes need to be stitched together. And that is something that we have been really interested in. <coughs> and so one of the main messages that I'm, I will try to convey is that how the visual brain solves this is through what we call an incremental grouping operation. Now, all those image elements that belong to a single perceptual object are incrementally uh, grouped together. Labeled, they're labeled in the visual cortex with an enhancement of neural firing rates. And psychologists call this object-based attention. So when I started in this field, we thought it was going to be solved by synchrony. Maybe some of you have heard about binding by synchrony, but it is not synchrony. It's really an enhancement of neural firing rates that label all those features, all those neurons coding for features that belong to a single perceptual object. And I'm going to demonstrate this to, do, to you today. Okay? So if this is the picture that comes into the system, our visual cortex creates this labeled representation. And we would like to understand, of course, how this happens in the visual cortex. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. First, I'm going to say a few words about feedforth and feedback processing. Then I'm going to talk about perceptual organization, contour grouping. Then I'll present some uh, relatively recent data that tell you what a visual system needs to do to be accessing consciousness. And in the last part of my talk, I'll also say a few words about uh, an exciting project we are now starting in the lab that aims to connect the camera to the brain of a blind person, thereby kind of imposing a rudimentary form of vision. <coughs> Start with the introduction. So a lot of the work we do in the lab is with monkeys, macaque monkeys, um, because they're an excellent model system if you want to understand what's going on in the visual cortex of humans. Um, I'm also going to present just a snippet of data that the things that we find in monkeys is indeed also happening in the brain of humans. Okay. So who has seen this slide before? I guess most of you. No? So you can raise your hand if you've seen this before. Yeah, that's what I suspected. So this is a very famous slide, right? This is 25 years old. So this is from Felman and Vanessen in a paper that, that's marked the, the start of the, of the, of the uh, journal Cerebral Cortex. And what they did here is they highlighted all the areas in the visual system of a monkey in color. And this is basically on the, on the flat map. So here you also see the cortex that is usually buried within the soul sign. <coughs> now, equally famous slide is this one. Here they show that they, you can arrange all these areas into this hierarchical scheme. Um, and I mean, there have been some subtle modifications, but this is still largely true after 25 years. And it, re uh, it resembles a little bit uh, a deep learning network, right? So these convolutional networks that are so efficient for artificial intelligence. So there seems to be quite a nice match between 
the systems for artificial intelligence, artificial vision, and, and how the visual cortex is composed. Now, if you now present a new image to the visual system, there is this first wave of feed for processing with the information coming in into the primary visual cortex and propagated to higher visual areas. And in early visual areas, simple features are computed, say the orientation of a bar. At intermediate levels, you find feature constellations of intermediate complexity. And in the top of the scheme, you basically find neurons tuned to the categories of objects. So that all happens relatively fast, say within the first 150 milliseconds. <coughs> but typically, we spend with our gaze, when we make a saccade, we spend there about 300 milliseconds. So there's time for additional processing. And we believe that this is carried by what we call recurrent connections. So these, this also involves the feedback connections that propagate information from higher to lower areas here in blue and lateral connections that interconnect neurons and also areas at the same hierarchical level, right? Allowing for recirculation of activity. And it's this phase that psychologists seem to identify with visual attention. So this is the first, say, feed forward phase is maybe pre-attentive vision and then the later recurrent phase involves shifts of attention. And this is also the phase where we believe that this incremental grouping process takes place. So that's why I think it's actually related to what psychologists call object-based attention. Okay, so this is, this is my view of the brain. So it's just the way I like to think about it. So if you put your electrodes in visual cortex or another sensory area, area, you'll find neurons that respond to a sensory stimulus. If you put your electrodes in parietal cortex or other association area, you find these sensory neurons, but you also find other neurons, so neurons with memory activity. So if there's a stimulus that's only briefly there, re is removed from, from perception and then you, and the instruction uh, movement, then there are these neurons that have persistent activity that bridge the time between a sensory stimulus and a movement. And there are neurons that, that become very active if something that, that, uh, that they're attuned to becomes relevant to behavior. So that this is what I call ramping activity. If you put your electrode in frontal cortex, you again find all of these, but now you also find neurons that respond around the time of the movement. And it's sometimes convenient, again, to think of this whole system as, as a network. Here there are only three layers, of course. In reality, there may be 10 or 15, or it probably depends on how you count. Um, so this is a purely feed-forward network. Now we know that we have these feedback connections, and as a result of that, Actually, some of this memory activity and ramping activity, so these selection signals, might also be reflected in early sensory cortex, right? So that's these small circles here, and that's basically also the basis of a lot that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so called these selection signals. And this is then the way I like to think about the whole system, how it works. So this is, again, the same network. Uh, activity comes in, there is this association layer, and then in the output layer you have Neurons that code for actions could be an internal action, say shift of attention. It could be an external action, an eye movement, a hand movement. So <coughs> an internal action, the shift of attention, suppose that this one gets selected, it might then impact on the activity in the association layer, association cortex. So that then impacts on what you might think as the internal state of the human Turing machine, or the primate Turing machine. If it's an external action, the sensory world may change. Say, with an eye movement, all the receptive fields fall on different locations. So that will also cause an update of the internal state of this machine. And now, of course, there is a different biasing towards the output layer. And now, on the next time step, another action, internal or external action, can be selected. Here's an update of the internal state. Another action gets selected. Of course, the challenge for the system is to develop a set of internal states that is maximally appropriate for selecting the right behavioral responses. Okay, and um, we have some theories about that. I don't have a lot of time to go into that. Okay, so now let's set our Turing machines to work. So I'm going to talk about this, this task that requires you to group together contour elements into larger percepts. And this is how it works. So I'll start with presenting you two curves. Now one of these curves is going to make a connection between the red dots 
and either the green dot or the blue dot. If you think that the red dot is connected to the green dot, you might want to raise your left hand. If you think it's connected to the blue dot, you might want to raise your right hand. Okay? Maybe you want to be just a little bit faster than your neighbor. Okay, are you ready for this? One, two, three. Ah, I see left hands. Well, average reaction time, three seconds. <laughs> okay. This is time to take revenge on your neighbor. So now you, we start from here. So one, two, three. Yeah, you're fast. And some people will raise both hands. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> okay, so you notice this takes a bit of time, right? So on average, this may take, say, eight seconds or so before you really work it out, <coughs> right? This is how it runs. You go all the way and then here and then, ah, it's blue. Now what happens here actually is this is, this is a stationary picture, so you're only going to make saccadic, jumpy eye movements. So people typically start directing their eyes to the red dot and then make a sequence of eye movements over the curve that needs to be traced. And it's interesting that your eye always then lands on this curve that needs to be traced, right? So suppose your eye is here, so your next eye movement might end up there and it will never end up on the wrong curve. How is that possible? Well, as you're looking here, you're actually doing a bit of mental tracing without moving your eyes. Basically, you're moving your mind's eye over this curve and then you make a saccadic eye movement. Then you make a real eye movement. And then you do a bit of mental tracing and then a bit of a, and then an eye movement again. That, that's how it works, okay? Now, of this, say, eight seconds, 10% is eye movement time. This is when your eyes are moving. The other 7.2 seconds is mental tracing. So the, here is the mental work. That's a lot of time, right? Because this information is there from time zero. So it's seven, more than seven seconds of mental work. It's a very slow process. Okay, so we wanted to find out what causes these delays. So we train monkeys on a, on a version of this task. They look at a small dot fixation point. That's where they direct their gaze. Then there are two curves, one of them I call target curve, that makes a connection between the fixation point and the larger circle. And this one is not connected, so this is a distractor. And then after a delay of 600 milliseconds, so all this time they're thinking, they're not yet moving the eyes. Then we remove the fixation point, and now they're supposed to report what is connected by making an eye movement. Of course, this is a much simpler stimulus than you, you just saw. Okay? So in this phase, we're going to record the mental activity as the animal is mentally tracing a curve. And to find out, we're going to record from the primary visual cortex. We typically take these chronically implanted electrodes. Now we use these Utah probes. I'll say a few words about them later. And this shows you then an example stimulus that, uh, that the monkey saw. So here, this is actually the receptive field. Of course, this was not shown to the monkey. This is in primary visual cortex, so it's the first stage of cortical information processing, right? This is the area that is supposed to be dumbest, if you want. <coughs> okay, so here, the receptive field is on the curve that the animal is mentally tracing. Here, the receptive field is on the distractor. And this shows you the activity so there's ongoing activity, these cells are always a bit active. Then you present the stimulus, so now something for the first time strikes the receptive field. There's feed forward processing, retina, algae, and primary visual cortex, and bang, you get the visual response. But then you have to wait a little bit, and then you'll see that after a while, when the animal thinks along the curve, and this thought basically comes through the receptive field, you get extra spikes. Okay, this is the orange curve which are not there if the animal is mentally tracing the other curve. Okay, so what you see here is a first wave of feed forward processing, that's this first peak, and then this recurrent processing starts, probably using feedback and lateral connections, and this process at some point then reaches the receptive field and then you get an increase in activity. This is this labeling process as I was talking about. Okay? Now here on the right, you basically get the same effect but now the two curves are intersecting. And when the activity reaches the receptive field, you get basically an enhancement of, of the farming rate. <coughs> okay. This is a, a, um, a study that we published already five years ago. And now you have 
two receptive fields. Here they're both on the target, here they're both on the distractor. And you see that receptive field one is closer to the fixation point, so probably closer to this, where this mental tracing process starts, than receptive field two. If you look at the activity of receptive field one, you see that you get a visual response. This is simply the delay between the retina and the cell in the visual cord. It's always 40 milliseconds. But you see that because the receptive field is close to the initiation of this curve tracing process, you get this enhancement of neural firing rates relatively early after 106 milliseconds. Receptive field two is basically farther from the fixation point. But you see the visual response, that is just kind of the, again, the, the delay between the retina and cell and visual cortex is still 40 milliseconds. But you now see that this enhancement of neural firing rates happens much later, okay, after 375 milliseconds. So based on quite a number of recordings, we come up with the following model that we call the growth cone model of object-based attention, where the activity starts at the fixation point and then gradually spreads over the curve. But we seem to find that when curves are far apart, that this spread is relatively fast, as if the visual system is using receptive fields that are fairly large, so you can make a lot of progress within a single synapse. Okay? Now you probably cannot use these very large receptive fields when the two curves are nearby because then activity would leak from one curve into the wrong curve. So there you might want to use small receptive fields, okay, like primary visual cortex receptive fields. So based on these considerations, at each location on the curve, we measured uh, the maximal size of a circle that is centered on that curve. And then you can basically, that's what we call a growth cone, and then you can measure the number of growth cone shifts that is necessary to, say, reach receptive field one, that is about one growth cone shift, and receptive field two, which is about three growth cone shifts. Okay, so this is shown here on the x-axis, the number of required growth cone shifts. This is a dimensionless number. And here on the y-axis, it's the measured latency of this response enhancement. Okay, and you see that it's about 50 milliseconds per growth cone shift. So what does that mean? That means that if you have two receptive fields that are in the same area that are touching but that are just not overlapping, it takes 50 milliseconds to go from here to here. 50 milliseconds in terms of neural processing is a lot of time. Okay, so that explains that in this task that I showed to you in the beginning, these delays really start to add up and can reach several seconds. Okay? So basically, you're looking at the speed of a mental process that takes place in visual cortex. So let me summarize this for you. So the next time you enter into, I don't know, bathroom or kitchen, and you're confronted with this puzzle, you want to pick up the hair dryer or you want to plug it in. So there are two plugs. Which one are you going to pick? Well, obviously, the white one. And we now know why. There's a very simple algorithm implemented into our brain that allows you to solve this puzzle. <clears throat> and we actually think that this is solved in the visual cortex at multiple spatial scales at the same time. Okay? So when you present the picture, there's this first wave of feed forward processing. So all these neurons here in, in white, they are activated, also the ones in red. There is something in their receptive field that goes fast. And then, at some level at the visual system, this tracing process starts. So these neurons start to enhance their response telling their neighbors they should also enhance their response. But here the curves are too nearby, so this, this cell cannot participate in this propagation. Fortunately, there are feedback connections. So the fast progress that actually happens in V4 is also visible in lower areas because through the feedback connections it seems that they're as clever as V4. And then V1 can take over, make sure that progress is also made where the curves are nearby. And at some point, it can tell V2 that can also start helping out again. And at some point, V4 can take over. Okay, so that's how we think of this process as an interaction between low level areas and high level areas, each making their contribution when it's most appropriate. Okay? Now, this is a, a neurophysiological point of view. We also did quite a lot of psychophysics in this task. <coughs> and basically, what you find is that in human observers, if you measure where their intention is, there are several tricks to do that, that they basically gradually spread what psychologists call object-based attention over the curve. So there's a very nice correspondence between the propagation of enhanced neural firing rates in the visual cortex and the propagation of object-based attention at the psychological level of description. <coughs>
Okay, so back to the Turing machine. So what we're seeing here is that basically when we are confronted with this complicated task, you see an updating of the internal state of the Turing machine, basically the propagation of the enhanced activity over the representation of a curve. And that is measurable even at the level of primary visual cortex. Okay? <coughs> now, we typically, we started this work maybe 20 years ago or so, doing it in monkeys, and we always were, of course, curious whether this would also happen in the human brain. We thought it would, but, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an animal model, so... <coughs> we were very happy that we have a collaboration with uh, neurosurgeons at the university in Amsterdam, the uh, Free University. And uh, they have patients that have a severe form of epilepsy. And these patients are often uh, treated with drugs, but sometimes the drugs don't help enough. So then a neurosurgeon comes in the picture, and he's supposed to take out the tissue that is most effective and responsible for the epilepsy. Now, in many cases, they can find out where the epilepsy comes from just during neuroimaging or other non-invasive techniques, but there's a small category of patients where they're really in doubt. And these patients get electrodes in their brain, right? So holes in the skull, electrodes in their brain. They stay there for 10 days or so. And we have ethical permission then to attach to those electrodes microwires so we can record spiking activity from the brains of those patients. Now, typically, these, these Epilepsy starts in the medial temporal lobe, so we typically get recordings from the medial temporal lobe, say hippocampus, entorhinal cortex. But this patient was very, very exceptional. Her epilepsy often started with visual hallucinations. So the epileptologist thought it would be a really good idea to put also an electrode in the early visual cortex. Never happened. Okay, so we were re really excited. <coughs> so we also attached micro wires to this electrode in visual cortex. And of course, we quickly set up an eye, an, an, an eye camera so that we could see where the uh, subject was looking. And then we asked her to do a curve tracing task. So he's fixating here, and then after a delay, he's supposed to make an eye movement to the end of the curve that she was mentally tracing. Okay? This is the electrode. So this is basically a reconstruction where the electrode was. And it's most likely that these two contact points, actually, we are only had two recordings. So we wrote a paper about two groups of neurons. But it was very obvious that we never get these results again, right? So the editor and the reviewers were kind of helping us there. And so these two electrodes worked. Um, and we think that they're both in area V3, which is still an early area, but it's not primary visual cortex. So the first thing we did then is, of course, the, the patient was looking at the screen, and then we were presenting stimuli, seeing where the receptive field is. So the receptive field was about here. And then we configured a curve tracing stimulus such that the target curve was going through receptive fields or, or not, right? So this is a distractor. Okay, so now we were really getting excited. Are we going to see the same effect as we saw had been seeing in the monkeys for so many years? And the answer is yes, exactly the same effect. Okay, what you see here is at time zero, we present the stimulus. So before time zero, it's just a gray screen with a fixation point, and then the stimulus appears. And you see you get the visually driven activity after a delay of about 40 milliseconds. And then after a delay of, what is it, maybe 150 milliseconds or so, you get extra activity if the receptive field is on the target curve as opposed to when it was on the distractor. Okay, very good news. What we see in the monkeys is really a very good predictor of what you can expect to see in the human brain. Okay, now... This task, this curve tracing task, may at first sight be something that you only do, say, well, once a week or so, when you want to kind of plug your hair dryer, who knows what, right? So, actually, I would like to propose that this is something that is not happening only two times a week. I think it happens every saccade you make. Every 300 milliseconds it happens. And to demonstrate that, we basically um, try to generalize this. So, for example, if, if you see this picture, you probably see that this is part of the same truck as this, and this is part of this truck, right? So that requires also some conceptual knowledge and no knowledge about the shape of trucks. And to test whether this is also such a serial process, we basically did the following task. We just presented two dots, dots and we asked subjects, are they on the same vehicle or not? Right? So here they're on the same vehicle, we varied the distance, <coughs> and this is the same distance as the previous one, but now they're actually on different components of the same object. 
And of course, we also had cases where the two dots were on different trucks, and that's what the subject reported. What we then find is that if these distances are short, subjects have a shorter reaction time than when these distances are longer, and they're particularly long if they're on two components, two separate components of the same vehicle. Right, suggesting that this process of incremental grouping indeed takes place also for, for typical images that you see in everyday life. Okay, it even goes, so this is how we think about it. It's basically this incremental grouping process I was talking about. Now this even happens in very simplified images. So this is a cartoon image of two monkeys. And again, it's the same task. We ask subjects, are these two dots on the same animal? Or are they on different animals? And if they're on the same an animal, we again systematically vary the distance between the dots. And what we then find is quite compatible with the growth cone model I was presenting. So we see that this propagation speed is fast. So this is basically reaction time schematically. So the propagation is fast if these regions within the animal are large and homogeneous. And it really slows down in the narrow regions of, of such a cartoon image. Okay, demonstrating that this, this incremental grouping process probably takes place uh, in, in almost every situation that, that you're confronting with multiple objects in the scene, which is actually almost always the case. Okay? So that's how we think of that. Um, so now I'd like to say a few words about the project that is related, but still a bit different. And that is the question, what does a visual stimulus need to do to enter into consciousness? Which is, of course, quite an ambitious question. Uh, so I'm going to present you with a very simple task. And so I'm going to present the stimulus. If you see the stimulus, please raise your hand. If you don't see the stimulus, don't. Okay, so one, two, three. Okay, that was easy. I'm going to make it more difficult now. One, two, three. Who saw it? Nobody. Okay. Let's try again. One, two, three. Yeah, some people saw it. Last chance. One, two, three. Who saw it? One person, two persons. Okay. And I'll be frank with you. There was actually only a stimulus in the first one and the third one. The second one, those who raised your hand committed to what we call a false alarm. Nothing to be ashamed of. It happens all the time. And the fourth one was also a false alarm. And actually, the third one, I think it was hardly visible <laughs> because it's, it's always very unpredictable how these monitors behave. Okay? So, and, and this, this type of task is very well described by a very old theory from the 60s of the previous century. It's called the signal detection theory. Who of you have heard about the signal detection theory? Some people, not so many. Okay, the idea of the signal detection theory is if you present a weak stimulus, a sensory stimulus can be visual or, or, sen or somatosensory, it doesn't matter, that there is somewhere in the brain there is an internal representation of signal strength. That is here indicated in, uh, with the green distribution across trials. Okay, so if you present a weak stimulus, then you're sampling from this distribution across trials, and so, in one particular trial, you might get this internal s representation of signal strength. And in the signal detection theory, you then put a threshold. And if the signal strength is higher than the threshold, you're going to say yes. It's called a hit. And if you fail to see it, even though it was there, right, it could be that the signal strength is just by the stochasticity of the process stays below threshold. You're going to say no. It's called a miss. Now, if there's no stimulus, then, of course, you get a, a weaker signal strength, but it still has a distribution. So typically, it will fall below the threshold, so that would be called, would be called a, a correct rejection. But occasionally, of course, that's what just happened. You, it might still be above thresholds, and so that would be called a false alarm. Okay? Now, it's interesting to consider what happens if you have, on average, a stronger stimulus. Then, of course, the, the signal present trials, will the distribution will be shifted to the right. Now, if you now use this same threshold, you'll see that you actually still have quite a number of false alarms. So, um, it might be a good idea to shift the threshold a little bit higher. 
So you're going to reduce the number of false alarms and you're not going to be punished by a, a large increase of the number of misses, right? That's the part of the green distribution to the left of the, of the dash line, okay? So you can afford to have a high threshold. Now, if you then apply this threshold in the case where the, the signal strength is weak, of course, you're, not, you're still going to have a very low percentage of false alarms, but now you're going to be punished because now you have going to have a lot of misses. Okay, so that's always this trade-off in the signal detection theory between the number of false alarms and the number of misses, and you can buy a subject by kind of increasing the costs of misses or increasing the costs of false alarms, right? So you can shift around this threshold. Now, what we asked in this study is, where is this internal representation of signal strength in the brain, and what causes the variability? So these are points we wanted to address, and what I'm going to sh show you turned out to be quite related to another theory of conscious perception. It's known as the global workspace theory by Stan de Hane. <coughs> and it works as follows. So if you present the stimulus, of course it ent enters in the LGN. If it's a visual stimulus, it goes to V1 to higher areas by these feed-forward connections. And then in the signal detection, or in, in, the, in the global workspace theory, there's a process that Stan de Hane calls ignition. Okay, and ignition actually is thought to rely on feedforward and feedback connections that are able to maintain a trace of, of a very weak stimulus, even if, if, if it's only briefly there, okay? So if the stimulus is taken away, then these recurrent connections maintain this trace of the stimulus, say, in working memory. That's the idea. And sometimes, maybe by a failure of the, of the propagation, this state of ignition is not reached, and then the stimulus would not a be able to enter into consciousness. That's the idea. Okay, so we trained monkeys on a very simple task, very straightforward. So on 50% of trials, we present the stimulus, just as you saw. And then there's a delay, and then the monkey was supposed to make an eye movement to the remembered location of the, of the stimulus. And there was always this reject dot. So on those trials where he didn't perceive a stimulus, he was supposed to make an eye movement to the re reject dot, right? The reporting that he hadn't seen any stimulus. <coughs> so that's how, this is how it worked. Now then, we varied the contrast of the stimulus, just as I did before. And of course, if the contrast is high, then the animal will always see it. Then there's a certain threshold region and if, if the contrast is very low, zero, zero means no stimulus, you see there's still a little bit of, of reports, so sometimes the animal just goes there, so that would be a false alarm. Okay, is that clear? So for the purposes of, of data processing, we defined two, and these are not thresholds I was talking about, this is another type of threshold, threshold for analysis, so we said when it's Accuracy is below 40%, we call the stimulus difficult. If accuracy is between 40 and 80%, we call it intermediate. And if it's higher than 80%, we call the stimulus easy. Okay? And then we're recorded from primary visual cortex, area B4, and also dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And we were in for a surprise. I wasn't expecting this. But what we're doing here is comparing stimuli of precisely the same contrast and those that enter into awareness in green, and those that were missed in red. So even at the level of primary visual cortex, you see a difference. So the stimulus, the stimuli that are going to make it elicit more activity than the stimuli that are going to be missed, as if there is variability in the propagation from the retina to the primary visual cortex. <coughs> you see that the difference, at least proportionally, becomes less for the stimuli with more contrast. And we quantify that as a missed fraction. That's the amount of activity that remains on the missed trials compared to the hit trials. Um, what is also interesting here is to see that those stimuli that are easy but missed, it is actually more activity than those stimuli that are difficult and seen. As if V1 activity is not a perfect predictor of whether a stimulus is going to make it into consciousness or not. And we did the same thing in area V4. We basically get more or less the same results. You see that the difference here is even a little bit larger for the difficult stimuli. So you get this increasing miss fraction. <coughs> Again, you see that easy miss stimuli elicit more activity than, than uh, difficult scene stimuli. Also suggesting that information can get lost from V4 downstream to higher visual areas. <coughs> 
and then causes a miss. But in dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, it was different. It was really more categorical. Now here I should say that we are recording from a, an area that is involved in the eye movement planning. Okay? So in some of the trials, maybe go back here just to explain it a bit better. Some of the, this is the receptive field of those neurons in, uh, in dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And the animal is basically playing an eye movement there. So sometimes he will plan an eye movement if he sees it, and he will plan this eye movement if he misses it. Right? So we did not dissociate the eye movement planning from basically the conscious percept. That's the only thing I want to say here. Okay? But you see, it's, it's nicely categorical. Whenever the animal is going to report and therefore saw the stimulus, you get this high level of activity. And whenever the animal fails to perceive it, you get a lower level of activity. Although you see that if the stimulus is stronger, the activity on average is a little bit larger than if the, if the stimulus is weak. Okay, so this could be one of the candidate regions where you have the representation of internal signal strength or the internal representation of signal strength. Okay? See, the miss fraction is also fairly constant. And here you could then put a threshold, right? If the, if the activity goes above threshold, then the animal will see it, and if it stays below threshold, he won't. Now, we also looked at those trials in which there was no stimulus. Okay? And then you see, actually, that on those trials where the animal is committing a false alarm, where it's going to make an eye movement to the receptive field of neurons in frontal cortex, even though there had been no stimulus whatsoever, you see this ramping of activity reaching the same level as on the hits. So what, we, what is going on here, we believe, is that sometimes the animal kind of thinks, hey, there may have been a stimulus, and he plans an, plans an eye movement there. Now, on those trials with false alarms, there is not a natural time zero. N the time zero is where we would have presented the stimulus had we presented one, but we did not, right? So these moments where you get these spontaneous spontaneous ignitions, you can think about it, may happen at different time points relative to the arbitrary point zero. Now, if you, if you average a number of curves that have different ramps at different times, or maybe I should do it like this from your perspective, right? So this is an early one, this is a late one. If you average this all together, you get this ramp. So that's how we explain it, but of course we cannot really demonstrate that. So that would explain the ramp. And you see that there's also a little bit of an enhancement of neural firing rates on the false alarm trials in V4 and V1. So we think this is actually a effect of feedback connections. Okay? So dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex has activity that is quite compatible with the internal representation of signal strength. Now the next question then is, what causes the variability? And people have looked quite a lot at kind of internal brain state markers that predict whether somebody is going to see a stimulus or not. And that's what we also set out to do here. <coughs> so one measure that could have predicted value of whether an animal is going to see a stimulus or not, so a scene versus a miss, a hit versus a miss, is the motivation. You think maybe the animal is performing better if he is highly motivated. And you can measure that because we present the fixation point and in the beginning of, of the day the animals are working for apple juice, so they are highly motivated in the beginning because that's how they earn their reward, earn their fluid intake. In the beginning of the day, he, when you present the fixation point, he immediately goes there. But by the end of the day, when he is satiated, it typically may take a little bit more time, may take a second or two before he goes there, right? So you can measure the TF time to fixate, so the time between the fixation point presentation and when the animal goes there with his eyes. And we basically find that if the time to fixate is long, then the probability of a hit is short, uh, is small. Okay, so you can basically can get a negative correlation and that is then expressed here as the area under the ROC curve. I'm not going to explain the details there, but the logic is that if, if a, if a pre-stimulus brain state marker has zero predictive power, then you'll be able to, to predict whether it's a hit or a miss with 50%, it's chance level. If there's some predictive power with a negative correlation, then it's going to be below 0 0.5. This is single trial decoding performance, right? So here it's about 0 0.46, so it, it basically means that with this information, with 54% probability, you'll be able to say whether the animal is going to have a hit or a miss, which is not terribly good predictive power anyway. Okay, but that's how it works. <coughs> so then you can look at pupil size. Many studies have looked at that. It's not overwhelming. You can look at the pre-stimulus firing rate. So now it's a positive correlation. But you see it's, it's rather weak. 
You can use, you can look at uh, EEG markers, alpha, beta, gamma. I mean, people write loads of papers about it, but you see it's all not too overwhelming. There are weak effects there. This is pre-stimulus, right? So this is, of course, you may, might not expect perfect predictive power anyway. And then we thought, maybe you can combine these pre-stimulus brain state markers in a linear combination. And then we're doing a little bit better. So now we're taking the eight pre-stimulus brain state markers and combine information from these individual ones, and then you see you have about 60% predictive power where 50% is chance level, which is, which is okay-ish. You can play the same trick on the stimulus, on the trials without the stimulus, predicting whether the animal is going to commit a false alarm or, or have a correct rejection. You're doing also around 60% correct, and we basically get the same results in the data when we do recordings from the other areas. That's not very surprising. Okay, so now I want to go back to the signal detection theory. So now we make a combination of pre stimulus brain state markers that I call B, and that is predicting whether the animal on the stimulus, on the trial without a stimulus, is going to commit a false alarm or going to have a correct reaction. Okay? So that in the signal detection theory, that basically corresponds to the location of the threshold. The false alarm rate is high if the threshold is low, and the false alarm rate is low if the threshold is high. Okay? So this is cross-validated, so this shows you that this, this parameter B that we can, can now compute because we know the combination of how to weigh all these different pre-stimulus brain state markers. We can compute it on every trial. Right? And these are the trials without a stimulus. NS means no stimulus, and you see that it's doing a decent job. So on, when the B is low, you get a low probability of a false alarm, and when the B is high, you get a, an increase in the probability of a false alarm. You see that on the, the trials with, with, with a stimulus, difficult, intermediate, or easy, the effect is, is weaker. Okay, so it's a relatively selective predictor of a false alarm. But now we can go back to the neural data. Right? So what do you predict? What is special about the neural data on those trials that are going to eventually lead to a false alarm? What do you think? Okay, <laughs> I didn't think anything either. <laughs> I was surprised by the result. So we now we're recording, of course, from all these areas. And what we find on those trials that have a high propensity to end with a half false alarm, there's a, an increased baseline firing rate of the neurons. Okay, so they're basically closer to the threshold for ignition. Makes a lot of sense, right? You see it in, in frontal cortex, you see it in V4 and V1. So this is a system that is close to kind of being ignited and then creating a working memory trace. Now, another trick that we did is to try to predict whether the animal is going to have a hit or a miss on the trials with a stimulus. But now we wanted to actually have a pure measure of sensitivity. So what we did is we tried to predict on those trials with a stimulus where it's going to be a hit. But we don't want to have repercussions of this combination of pre-stimulus brain state markers on those trials without a stimulus. We don't want to have an increase in the false alarm rate. So that's called sensitivity in the signal detection theory. And it corresponds to the distance between those two curves. Okay, so we don't want to increase the blue area, but we want to actually to increase the green area. Turned out to be possible. It's, it was a bit involved, but it turned out to be possible. And this is basically, this is cross-validated. So you see it works. There's no increase in the false alarm rate, and there's an increase in the hit rate. So we, here we have relatively few trials. So the significance only appeared on those trials with intermediate uh, contrast because that is where the animals always were working uh, around this, this point where they were about, say, 50% correct. Okay, so many trials here. Okay, so now what do you think is different on those trials with a high sensitivity? Well, there's a better propagation of activity from V1 to higher areas. That's what you see here. You see basically a faster ramping in, 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 in the frontal cortex. You see a bit of an increased response in V4 and, and, and a trend in the same direction in V1. Okay, so let me summarize this. If this is the standard situation, on those trials with a high bias, a high propensity to have a false alarm, you might actually have predicted that the threshold is lower. But actually what you see is the distributions shift to the right. Both distributions shift to the right, which is equivalent to lowering the threshold, of course. Okay, so then you get an increase in the probability of a false alarm and, of, of course, also a slight increase in the number of hits. Now, high sensitivity, so an increase in the number of hits without 
an increase in the false alarm rate is associated with a better propagation of the activity from V1 to higher visual areas. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because then you separate these two distributions better. Okay? So <coughs> we basically seem to see then that there is a variation in the propagation of activity from, from one area to the next. But actually there are, there are many routes for visual information to reach frontal cortex. Not all of them need to go through cortical cortical connections. So we wanted to see whether there's also variability in the efficiency of cortical cortical propagation. So what we did is we stim I started to micro-stimulate primary visual cortex and we started to record in area V4. Okay? So the task is the same as, I saw bef as you saw before, but now the animal is we're not presenting anything on the screen. We're directly activating primary visual cortex with micro-stimulation. Then we know from previous research that the animal is going to see a, a light percept at a particular location of the visual field, basically where the receptive field is, on 50% of trials. And on the other 50% of trials, we don't micro-stimulate. Okay? And then now on the x-axis, it's microamps, current instead of contrast, but you basically get the same phenomenon. And this shows you a receptive field in V1 in white and V4 uh, in false color. So if you want receptive fields are smaller, so here's where, where we're stimulating, and in V4 is where, we, where we're recording at the same time. And this is basically single trials, so this is a decent microstimulation train. It's, fifth, it's only 20 milliseconds. It's five pulses with five milliseconds between individual pulses. And basically you see that on every trial you get a, a decent response in area V4 if these receptive fields are overlapping. Okay. Now we're again comparing trials with the same microstimulation in v v V1, and some of them that reached consciousness and some of them that did not. And basically you get the same effect, right? With a large difference on the difficult trials with a weak microstimulation train, and proportionally a, a smaller difference on the easy trials with a strong microstimulation train. So you basically get the same effect. This is the misfraction. Okay? So yes. There is also variability in the efficiency of propagation of, act, uh, of activity from one area to the next. And that contributes, of course, to the variability of conscious perception. Now, when I presented this data to Stan de Hane, the champion of the, of the, of the global workspace uh, theory, he became really excited because he had made models about this. His models were typically complicated with many neurons. And then he said, you know what? I'm going to model this with the simplest model you can imagine. So he made a model that has only five neurons, five stochastic neurons. One in LGN, one in V1, one in V4, one in parietal cortex, and one in frontal cortex. <coughs> now, if you present the stimulus, there are feed-forward connections in the model that propagate the information to higher levels. There are self-connections within the areas, and there are feedback connections. Now, he made the connections between parietal cortex and frontal cortex so strong that if a certain level of activity is reached, they will basically self-sustain each other's activity. Okay, so that would be ignition. If you reach that threshold, then you get ignition. These neurons basically are always active. If you take away the stimulus, they will stay active. And a little bit of that activity will, of course, also percolate down to V4 and V1 through the feedback connections. Now, because these neurons, this would be a hit, because these neurons are stochastic, sometimes for a weak stimulus, this ignition may not happen. Right? It stays below the threshold for self-sustained activity. So if you then take away the stimulus, the activity collapses, and it would be a miss. That's the model. Okay, this shows you then, in the simple model, the activity of the single V1 neuron on those trials with a weak stimulus, intermediate stimulus, strong stimulus, those that are going to be seen and those going to be missed. So you see you get a fairly good uh, uh, um, a, uh, approximation of what we saw in, in V1 with an increasing misfraction. We basically get from the model very similar activity in V4. And since frontal cortex is part of this, this kind of bistable network with very strong reciprocal connectivity, you basically get this bistable behavior as well. And um, and you also get, on the false alarm trials, you get this ramping. What happens here is there's no stimulus, because, but the whole system is a bit stochastic. So say on 5% of trials, it happens that due to the stochasticity, activity reaches this threshold for self-sustained activity, and basically the system clamps into this ignited state. 
Now this happens at different times relative to where we would have presented the stimulus, hence the ramping of the activity. Okay? So this was for Stan a uh, Sunday afternoon. <laughs> this was for us four years of hard work. And you see that the res resemblance between the data and the model is quite amazing. Of course, in the model there are quite a number of parameters, maybe 20 or so, because we have all the connectivities between the areas, and, but we didn't really tweak it too much. So this was relatively easy to, to obtain in the model. Okay, so basically what we see is that weaker stimuli tend to get lost at lower hierarchical levels than stronger stimuli. False alarms can be explained by spontaneous ignitions, and we see that behavioral and neuronal marks of pre-stimulus brain state can predict bias and sensitivity. And we see that the global workspace theory does, uh, does an excellent job in, in explaining those results. Okay, how much time do I have left? Do I have like five or 10 minutes? Oh, that's good. Okay, so now we're applying this knowledge and that's the project that we're now working on in the lab. So this is to kind of impose activity directly onto the visual cortex for people who are blind. So in the world there are about 40 million blind people. Some of them will be implanted with a retinal chip. Right, so that's here. But you must realize that many people who are blind actually have a severe eye disease and uh, the ganglion cells are responsible <coughs> They're in the retina, and they're responsible for making the connection to the brain. <coughs> so if the ganglion cell cells die, then basically this connection is also lost. So there are no fibers anymore in the optic nerve. Right? So it does make sense to put a chip in the retina. So you can put it in the LGN. And we, do it, uh, we are interested in the primary visual cortex. So in both hemispheres, it's a huge area. It's about 25 square centimeters. Right? So that's like a football field in, in neural terms on either side. Okay, now we know there is retinotopy, so no surprises there. If you stimulate, then we also know that the subject patient is going to see a dot of light at that location in space. Now, we're not the first to do this. I just want to show this. So this is work from the 60s of previous century. So this is Giles Brindley, and he had a, he had a wireless system. So what he did, he had, he had uh, I think, two or three patients, and he implanted small coils on the skull of the patient below the skin. And there's a small wire with a grid of electrodes lying against the surface of primary visual cortex. So when he then used the coil, so this is now of course on top of the skin, he induced the current in one of those, uh, in one of these coils under the skin, and that was then propagated through the wiring to the visual cortex. And this patient was able to see dots of light when he, he was using this trick. Okay? Now we are fif about 50 years later, so we think we should be doing better now. I mean, this is a field that has not made too much progress, to be honest, in the, in the last 50 years. But I think this is the time to make the progress. Okay, so we're in, in now we're using in the lab these Utah probes. So these are electrode arrays that have about 100 contact points. If you stimulate one location, then the monkey is going to see a dot of light. We now put more than 1,000 electrodes, so then you can, in principle, create 1,000 phosphenes, and you can work with them like a matrix board along the highway, right? So if you, s if you activate one light bulb, then you're going to, going to see a dot. But you can, of course, put a pattern there and then uh, impose meaningful information. Right? So creating a clever pattern and just activating a subset of the phosphenes should be able to convey information. Okay, so this is the system we want to build. This is a camera that you can just buy, and then you need to do some clever tricks to translate camera footage into brain stimulation patterns. There we actually use the knowledge we have about segmentation, really kind of the meaningful chunks in the outside world that you want to impose on the cortex. <coughs> um, we test this in the monkeys. We now have, this is the, uh, the thing that we implanted. We are not yet wireless, so this is really fixed to the skull of the monkey, and these are, 16 electrode arrays, each 64 electrodes. This is the neurosurgeon who helps us. So all these electrodes enter into the visual cortex very close near, closely nearby. And this shows you the receptive fields. So we were very successful in, in the monkeys. We have two monkeys now who have this. And we basically get, get good recordings for, from about 90 to 95% of the electrodes. And these are the receptive fields. So this is the animals looking straight ahead. You see the receptive fields cover only a quadrant of the visual space. And these animals are not blind, so you can just present a, a visual stimulus, 
And this is basically showing you the activity of, and I think in this case, about 990 electrodes. And we are presenting to the animal a bar of light that we sweep across the screen. And this is the activity of the neurons. So you see that a bar of light is, is followed by a wave of activity of the appropriate neurons one at a time. I mean, it's, it's not very surprising. It's just Yule and Wiesel times 1,000, okay? But it's nice to see that it works. Now that's not, of course, what we want to do. We want to use microstimulation, and you basically saw already uh, uh, that we did that in, in, the other, in the other study. So we first trained the animal to make an eye movement to the visual stimulus, replace it by an electrical stimulus. You've seen this. And this shows you then, this is the, the, where the animal directs its gaze. So we now can do this for hundreds of electrodes. And you see that also works. So this is the, uh, the receptive field of the electrode we're stimulating. And you see the animals going there. So we can do that for hundreds of electrodes now. And we're actually now working to see whether the animal also can recognize patterns. So we have trained the animals on, on an alphabet of 16 letters. And we see whether we can impose those letters by pattern stimulation on the visual cortex. And the first results are, are somewhat encouraging. So we, we may be able to do this. Okay? So this is what we want to build. And the not entirely unambitious goal is to be ready for our first in human in 2023. So that's something that we will be har working hard on in, in the next couple of years. Okay? So this then summarizes what it, I wanted to tell you today. These are the people who did the work. Early work on curve tracing was done together with Victor Lamme and Hank Spekreise, and the high areas were recorded with Paul Kayat and Arazu Porismali. Matt Self, uh, Hans Baye, Jesse Possel, Judith Peters, and Rainer Goebel are helping out with uh, single unit recordings. I actually only showed two neurons of that study. And Sing and Fung, they are involved in the, in the prosthesis uh, study. And now realize people are missing from the slides. So the consciousness study was done together with uh, Stan de Hane and uh, Hauman Savai uh, and Stefano Panzieri. So they're in Italy. Hauman is now in, in the US. And people from my lab were Bram van Furcht, Dev Fartak, and uh, Bruno Danino. Thank you very much.